I'm John C. Havens. Um, I'm the author of a book called Artificial Intelligence. I'm a consultant and I have the pleasure of right now being the, uh, the executive director of the IEEE Global Initiative for Ethics of Autonomous and Intelligent Systems. I'm also the executive director of something called the Council on Extended Intelligence. For the interview, everything that I say will be my opinions and don't necessarily reflect the, uh, the, the actual views or, or formal policies of IEEE and the Council. My work in AI began out of straight up fear. <laughs> I, um, I was interviewing, I was doing a series of interviews for Mashable. I've written for Mashable and The Guardian and Slate and Fast Company. And um, I wasn't in the AI space, um, but about eight years ago I started interviewing people saying, what's the code of ethics for AI? Ignorantly thinking everyone will refer to like, oh, it's the Smithton <laughs> code written in 1985. And more and more what happened is people said, well, we use Asimov's Three Laws of Robotics uh, as our kind of code to ask questions. And initially I, th I was like, that's a short story from the 50s. You know, do you, I'm a big fan of the story. Um, so it started from fear. So in terms of science fiction and my work with artificial intelligence, or what I and the people I'm working with, we tend to call it autonomous and intelligent systems, and I'll tell you about that in a second. But I've been a fan of like Philip K. Dick, you know, Robert Heinlein, you know, for years. And I watched Star Trek, the original series. Granted, they were in the repeats at that point with, with my dad. And um, Battlestar Galactica, the, the newer one, not the older one, is fantastic. So the narratives around what will the future bring is something I've immersed myself in ever since I was a kid. Star Wars, same thing. And the reason I was initially fearful was mainly thinking how much of technology is being built where there may be questions people are not asking, not because they are not good people, right? meaning moral people or people who have the best intentions, but I very quickly realized that intention isn't really about what then manifests in the technology. And this is, I think, where the message from a lot of great science fiction films, you know, the classics of 2001, et cetera, are these great questions about, you know, if they're, if it's kind of like intermediate, you know, like Terminator type stuff, like I'm not as interested in sort of just like the us versus them narrative. Mm -hmm. But when it can ask these deeper questions of who are we as humans, and like my last book, Artificial Intelligence, I asked the question, how will machines know what we value if we don't know ourselves? The original fear that I had was that asking that question outside of any technology is very hard. Introspection is hard. And if we're not willing to do it and sort of want to let technology, as cool as it may be, kind of usurp certain decisions, then we risk losing things or giving things away without meaning to or taking it away from others in one sense where it's not causing, say, overt physical harm, but there may be mental harm, there may be well-being harm, and there may be long-term sort of, again, usurpation of things that we in one sense can't get back. Sure, so in um, one of my past lives, uh, I was an actor for 15 years, and um, I still am a journalist slash writer, meaning I've written a number of pieces for The Guardian and for Mashable and Slate. I just had a piece published uh, yesterday in Quartz. Um, so journalism for me, um, I never went to journalism school. I know the ASJA guidelines and how to be objective and all that type of stuff, but really I'm just, uh, I love learning. My uh, grandfather, my mom's dad, was a high school principal uh, for 45 years. And up until even the time he was 92 or 93, you just saw a person who found learning infectious. He had a big stack of books next to his chair. He got me, he, I fell in love with 60 Minutes because of him, like that chick, 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 chick. It's like this visceral, like, it's Sunday night, you know, like, I'm gonna learn something. And the idea of self-improvement, I've always loved, where it's not like, hey, you're broken, fix yourself but hey, you're at a great place, what else can you do to enhance? And by enhance, meaning for me, it's always kind of been more about like arts, like learning, and so I love asking questions. To me, journalism is like, I'll find this germ of what I think is a unique idea, 
And then most of my articles start off with like, do you think this is unique? And someone will be like, except that 14 people have written a book about it. And I'm like, okay. Um, so then, but like uh, a lot of my books started from asking questions where I've never called myself a futurist. I, I, of, I often like back away slowly from people like, I'm a futurist, as compared to like a presentist who kind of sees three or four trends that are kind of moving towards themselves. Mm -hmm. That's where science fiction to me is in fiction. Like my work, I try to say, look, this thing over here, like I'm very focused on virtual reality and augmented reality and how that's going to affect human well-being right now. Because I can point to 14 companies doing stuff but they already have a prototype or you know something much more advanced um, in terms of headsets that people are wearing. But it's to say that trend doesn't live in isolation from this thing over here just because these two groups aren't thinking about it. So anyway, science fiction, you know, imaginaries, narratives, um, I think I have a benefit of having been an actor and having been in TV shows like Law and Order. <laughs> I was laughing because the science, you know, it's a certain amount of science but uh, involved there. Um, but is the sense of the world outside of the experts building the technology, the first thing they see is Westworld, Black Mirror. They know these movies. And then to sort of say like, hey, don't be frightened, don't be freaked out. But this is still what appears when they watch TV, they naturally are going to say, like, well, where are the positive messages? And that's like, you know, what you're doing here and, and other people have done so beautifully is to say we have to paint a vision of a positive future. And there's some episodes of Black Mirror, for instance, which will have, here's a really cool, the technology is always awesome, can be scary in terms of if it does negative, unintended stuff. But then here is a world when this is here that we can look to that could be positive. It makes it much easier not just to build it amongst the experts, mm -hmm. but for the average person, as it were, to build it in their minds. Mm -hmm. You have to think for a second, a complex system easily translated to the public. That's a tough one, because when you say translated to the public, oftentimes what happens is the translation is, hey, that thing that's in your house, sign a couple of waivers or this consent form and there you go. Mm -hmm. And having worked in PR before, the main thing that is communicated are the, 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 the sort of consumer values or benefits. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where outside of, again, the unintended, unintended negative consequences and to try to stay more positive and proactive, people tend to forget what unintended positive consequences could be instead of just having kind of a hand-wringing feeling of like, oh, the ethicists are in the room, here we go. <laughs> you know, like, here's the limitations, what legislation's going to be, you know, and, uh, you know, I worked in the business world, I understand, that's scary. Also, just when you've built this beautiful piece of technology, and, and I, I get it, I'm a musician, I'm a writer, was an actor for years, you create something and you're like, look, I just want you to love the beauty of what I've created. And then someone says things like, well, someone might slip and fall. And you're like, oh, here we go. <laughs> okay. But the realm that I've lived in my whole life, and I'm, I'm trying to get back to your idea of who has communicated this well, so I'm just trying to think of it while I'm talking. Um, but my dad was a psychiatrist. My mom still is a minister. And I'm a writer, or still a writer, used to be an actor. So I'm steeped in introspection, meaning studying humans, myself included. Oftentimes, it's very annoying. Because you're talking to people and you're like, I wonder why I said that. Well, Brecht said this about, Plato mentioned this. And you're like, oh, God, I just want to, I just want to say something and not have to examine it 48 <laughs> times. Um, but I think a lot of times, uh, oh, here, it's coming to my mind. I was just at an event and UNICEF was at this event. And we were talking about human rights and artificial intelligence. And they had a two or three page pamphlet that was beautiful in terms of communicating to parents. It was highly visual. And it was like a, a two to three page thing where most of it was, you might picture it like inside a, like an infographic inside of Wired magazine, you know, what parents should be aware of. And it, it had a, um, uh, a, uh, um, a caveat aspect to it, but it wasn't a fear. And as a parent especially, I felt empowered reading it. And the visuals were very beautifully done. It was, here's what you need to do in terms of your child's data. Here's what you need to think about. It was the best practices document. So kudos to UNICEF. And kudos to also addressing um, a, 
massively huge, globally important demographic, which is parents. Because this is where when discussions about data or other things happen, I think as a parent, I speak for myself, you move from the sort of what can sometimes be esoteric or like the nature of privacy, dun, 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 you know, in the, in the ancient times, privacy to like my kids looking at that screen and can be accessed by these negative actors, not any specific company, but these things. Um, and UNICEF, I think, is a great example of, of someone that did that, did that well. In terms of the responsibility that I feel uh, for the work I'm doing, again, I'm, I wear different hats. So I'll speak for some of the organizations that I'm honored to be a part of, and just restating not as much of a disclaimer standpoint, but saying that IEEE, it's the world's largest technology association, started 130 years ago by Thomas Edison. It's a very respected organization, over 420,000 members in 160 countries, but really the heart of the engineering community. And I'm not an engineer, but I have been deeply honored to work with, and this comes back to like my grandfather, like style of learning. I, I just never had many engineers in my family. My brother-in-law is an engineer. And so we always geek out together about the new technology, but when you really understand sort of a sense of how to build, say, a standard, and you actually, and, and literally a standard, like a, people get in a room for three years and write out a standard document, um, you know, I've been on Broadway, <laughs> right? I can get up in front of 2,000 people and sing. You want to lead a standards working group, you better have a thick skin and be ready to navigate um, a room full of experts, but also um, people that are, uh, uh, in terms of communicating, there's a very specific thing, the term called requirements among engineers, which I didn't know about. And I remember I had to struggle. People kept saying, well, the requirement for this. And I was like, oh, do I check with Bob, you know, and I triple E to make this? And they're like, no, it's a requirement. <laughs> they kind of gave me this face. It's a requirement. And it's an actual language thing. Thou shalt, like right? shall. The word shall in terms of a standard means then there's no, it's unequivocal that when you move, you know, this coffee mug from A to B, you shall do it this way. All 300 people doing a standard agree. Mm -hmm. It's mesmerizing. It's glorious, mm -hmm. because also it means the people from around the world, maybe speaking different languages, still all say in their different languages from like a Tower of Babel inward standpoint. So we're moving it left to right. Yes. And then when that piece of paper comes out, by the way, it's not like it's perfect or everyone agrees, and, but through consensus, mm -hmm. when this thing comes out, it can form this amazing piece of what is often called soft or pre-legislation, where people can go, you know what? Thank, thank goodness these people got in a room and did this because it means that 300 smart people already did all this thinking. So unless we're going to mirror and also work for three years, they probably thought a lot of the things that we're going to think. So it saves so much time. So one thing is uh, in terms of the, the duty or the responsibility, I'm, I'm, I'll say it again, but I'm, I'm, I'm honored to work with IEEE. I'm a fanboy. I'm completely not objective. <laughs> Um, are there things about, you know, any, or, any big organization, there are challenges, of course. But in terms of, like, you know, the nobility of engineering, all these things where I'm not an engineer, so I can say this. Like, you know, uh, the, the old adage of you don't build a bridge to fall down, right? Um, you don't talk to an engineer, or I don't. I learned very quickly not to be like, hey, ethics. Let's talk about ethics to an engineer. Because they're like, yeah, I, I build an elevator, and I know, I know about risk because I save people's lives. That's the nobility side. What's exciting for me, though, is when, when I first had an idea for what became the work that's now at IEEE that I'm executive director of. And by the way, there's a, a chair named Raja Shatila, who is a world-renowned roboticist. I am one part of a magnificent group of experts where I get the honor of sort of herding, as it were, very smart cats. But I also do a lot of strategy and tactics. And Konstantinos Katahalios, the managing director of the Standards Association, uh, I, I call him the godfather. I hope he's okay with that. <laughs> he calls me the catalyst um, because I brought an idea that was a germ. He'd already been working with IEEE to say, like, how do we rethink, essentially, design? Because that's what a lot of people don't get when the word ethics comes up with AI. They go to oh, utilitarianism and the tunnel problem. And if I talk about the tunnel problem again, I hope that's not what you're going to ask me. I will, I will hurt myself ethically. Um, but is to say... When you ask more questions, especially about human agency, data, and emotion, 
using methodologies like values-based design, value-sensitive design. You can take the existing amazing bedrock of what engineers and programmers, data scientists already do and say the questions that you're already asking about risk, this is intended to be a compliment. This is intended to be a yes and to help you. Because also one thing, when I brought this idea to IEEE, I thought to myself, with whatever this idea is that I'm bringing, the world's leading engineering organization that I've always thought of kind of like the, the UN of technology in one sense, because it's not about IEEE says this, it's all the members get together and through consensus, then a policy statement happens after the board ratifies it and says, is this what we all think? Yes. So that sort of global consensus, I said, well, if, we, if I bring this sort of idea that's got ethics and applied ethics and philosophy and social science to IEEE, by the way, they're already doing a lot of that stuff anyway, but is then they can build it. We need it built. I'm a pragmatist. Mm -hmm. We need to say, how do we build this stuff? As compared to, I have many friends who are philosophers. I love them dearly. But had I gone to like a global philosophy group and said, what are we going to build? It would have been really interesting and cool. And then I would say, great, how do we build a standard? And, you know, maybe crickets. So the real, the real message, however, the real responsibility um, is to bring these groups together. And I get very nervous, especially now in 2018. We're in a university um, setting or in a, any setting. We're going to be talking about what to do with the future of AI. <clears throat> I'm like, great. Uh, who is it? That's data scientists. Like, are there any social scientists or psychologists? Nope. And I'm like, can you get the social scientists? You know, Because what else are we going to do if we're not cross-pollinating? So um, anyway, that's an answer sort of for the IEEE work. So in terms of responsibility then, I'm also executive director of this really cool newer thing we're doing called the Council on Extended Intelligence. Um, I had the massive honor of meeting Joey Ito, and I'm s totally unsubtle about my heroes. You know, people like Elon Norbush, for instance, Joey Ito, Eric Clapton, you know, those types of people. And um, uh, I do love Eli, by the way. I'm not just saying that. I'm just saying that. Um, but I got to meet Joey Ito, who I think most people just know. He's one of the most fabulous brains on the planet. Full stop. And if someone's like, I don't think Joey Ito's a whatever, I'm like, mm-hmm. I gotta go, you know. <laughs> anyway, so I went to this thing. I got invited to an Aspen roundtable on AI. And first of all, I got in the room and I was like, I'm, why am I here? <laughs> you know, like the head of the Knight Foundation. I was so honored and like, and after about like ten minutes of like pure like terror, like should I say anything? I'm like, I got invited, and I was saying things that are a lot of my personal work but also that thankfully IEEE is mirroring, or, or I should say that it's not just me that's thinking th this way, uh, but again, I just am conscious of not wanting to give the impression that IEEE is whatever. Um, but I talk a lot about well-being, and this is something that at a personal level I'll, I'll tell in the third part of my answer. But this idea of well-being is not mood, it's not about happiness, it's about understanding how a human being actually flourishes. And flourishing means having known my dad's work and mental health and um, things like productivity, right? Like getting a lot of stuff done, great, awesome. But the sort of how everything is connected to like the work that we do, you have to make money to earn a living, cool. But then when you work to not just make enough to survive and take care of your family, but the message is like you always have to have more, which in general is what the gross domestic product or sort of productivity as a value makes us do as humans, right? Mm -hmm. So that's fairly Western. It's definitely uh, uh, something that, that is part of, if when you actually study the economic aspect of GDP, it's a great metric in the sense of people agree about it. You know, they can measure it. But it's very myopic in the sense of, is a country only about how much stuff they produce? So I bring this up because I was saying this type of thing in this room in Aspen, where uh, you think people, they're very polite, a lot of people liked it. Some people were like, aren't we talking about AI? Who's the guy, who's the whatever guy talking about well, what, well being? Because I'm used to that. I've been writing about this for six or seven years. And even then, you know, I'm like, well, the OECD, Better Life Index, Bhutan scores national happiness. This, I'm, I, I'm patient because it's a paradigm shift. Like if you mention the word, you know, neoliberalism, sometimes people will be like, I don't know what you mean. Or if you even dare to say, can we talk about capitalism? Like, it just turns instantly political, which is sad. Mm -hmm.
because it's like, let's remove these, these big names like capitalism and socialism, because of course they'll be mired in, well, socialism, Marx, Stalin, right? And like some really bad stuff with Stalin, granted. But it's more about, hold on, hold on, hold on. What about the commons? What about Eleanor Ostrom, another one of my heroes, the only woman uh, to be given the Nobel Prize for economics? Like there's thinking that we have to understand that values created the philosophies that undergird economics. Economics is a lot of statistics, but it's a lot of ideology first and foremost that drives who we are and what we do. So long introduction to say I was saying these types of things and Joey Ito was like nodding. And I was like, I just said something and Joey Ito nodded. So unless he just got like a text, like, do you want to get lunch later or something? <laughs> That's cool. And we ended up talking and uh, I was so thrilled because he's like, I had this idea or we're doing a lot of work at MIT about extended intelligence. And I didn't know what that meant. And extended intelligence, MIT is doing a lot of really great work on this. It's this idea of systems thinking, a la Donella Meadows, who I'm a big fan of her. And it's this idea, especially when you think of uh, computationalism, the mindset among some circles of AI practitioners, that when you can copy you know, all the dendrites of my brain, John's brain over here into silicon, then John is A and B. And, and that's a belief, and I'm not here to, to say if that's what a person believes, they believe it. But the systems thinking idea, one aspect of it is to say, well, just because John's intelligence, as it were, is copied from A to B, what about how he relates to other humans? What about his relationship to the environment. This is a systems mindset, certainly something with the environment. For instance, this is obvious, but if we're able to copy all of our brains into uh, silicon, then a lot of the actual world, the planet itself, wouldn't be as necessary in the sense of the main thing you need is then air conditioning. To, then you don't need trees or water or whatever mm -hmm. else. And anyway, so I introduced Joey to Konstantinos Katahalios and uh, we came up with this idea for the Council on Extended Intelligence, which the first part of it is to change the narrative, and this is something I do feel a duty about with the public, is to change the narrative around artificial intelligence, air quotes. Um, most practitioners will say, which you agree, it's, like, it's kind of like saying electricity or the web, it's just so general to say AI. The next question most practitioners will say is, wait, machine learning, cognitive computing, what are we talking about? AGI, so first of all, the phrase, you know, God bless Alan Turing and all the people that made it what it is, but it's a phrase that needs to evolve. Mm -hmm. So we in IEEE, our work say autonomous and intelligent systems, which again, often needs clarity. But the actual phrase in the media oftentimes comes with an us versus them. Artificial intelligence, whatever company, you know, AlphaGo just beat the world's best player at Go. Mm -hmm. This thing just beat lawyers. This thing just beat writers. This thing just beat... What, what is the message we think as technologists, by the way, I'm saying this is media, not technologists, and I'm not putting down the technology. I'm saying the way that the technology is framed to, you know, my mom is like, oh, I guess I suck, <laughs> right? Because it's inevitable that people are building things to beat me in everything that I can do. And then we have these conversations about AI and work, and this will never be replaced. And I'm like, do you read the papers? Maybe it's link bait. But the message that we, that media is sending is that A, technologists, which is not true. I triple E, this is not the case. I triple E is very positive about technology as they should be. That's why I want to work with them. It's not like a, <laughs> why would they be negative, you know? But if the media message is, it's just a matter of time till you get replaced, that's not going to help anything. And, and also there's this whole idea kind of like, Augmentation, and I'm getting to extended intelligence here, but augmentation, depending on who says it, there can also be kind of a, 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 a if not an agenda, a delay. Like, hey, we're going to work with, machines are going to live with AI. My answer is cool. How long? What does that mean? Be specific. Mm -hmm. And then go read Martin Ford's Rise of the Robots. I love Martin Ford. I met him years ago, and he talked to a lot of people. He, he, he makes them mad. But he gives good, solid examples. He's like, UPS. I think it's him or NPR, but I think it was him. UPS. Uh, and I'm, I don't mean to demonize a specific company. I mean that type of you know, delivery system of a vehicle. Now, whatever, whatever number of uh, companies might be doing this, they have 75 sensors so that when the truck backs up to the curb, if it's two inches versus one, that's noted. 
right? And so all these different things. What Martin's basic point is, is with any of these examples, is he says, be aware that when we say we're living alongside of AI and we'll work together, 99% of the time that means there's a system being trained to know what you do so you can be replaced. And I'll go back to my GDP thing, which is businesses have a legal mandate mm -hmm. to maximize, especially if it's a shareholder thing, maximize shareholder return. And you can't be like, hey, I can replace the human workforce and increase productivity by 60%, decrease risk and decrease uh, mistakes by 70%, and make a 17 times much as mon money. Mm -hmm. There's no business imperative to not have that happen. So anyway, all that to say, extended intelligence is this idea of like, hold on, let's rethink things like participant design, it's a term, like thinking about the end users, um, or um, user-centric design, and especially thinking of the environment not in a very Western sense. The environment, most of us think about like, that's the environment. See those trees? I hope I can save those trees as compared to more of an Eastern mindset or of a systems thinking mindset is, we're actually one with the environment. And if we don't take care of what's out there, it is also in here, the water we drink, et cetera. And so also with um, the council, it's really exciting. We're working with a lot of indigenous populations because they also have, have mentioned that being anthropocentric, saying things like human-centered AI, that phrase will actually upset a lot of indigenous people. I think in terms of labor, it's a, obviously a multifaceted issue. It's very contextual about the country where you live. So first I'll start there. I'm always fascinated when I go to Europe versus I live in the States. Um, you know, when you go to Europe and you talk about things like universal basic income, a lot of times Europeans are like, you mean like what we have? <laughs> right? Like universal, not every country, universal health care, kids go to college for free. A buddy of mine, he'll complain about taxes and he's like, 60% taxes. And I'm like, I'm like 48 and I don't get health care, buddy. And if he ever got let go from his company, I think he said it's like 90% full pay and he's got health care. So I'm like, do you like, you know, do you drop things on occasion or like just mess up so you can get let go? Because like, are you kidding me? Like, yeah. um, so I think first of all is it's always interesting to talk about labor in the context of it. Secondly, I, I like asking these questions more and more at AI events, which is I go talking about, you know, future of work and robots will work together. And, and I raise my hand and I'm like, just for interest, how many people in this room have ever gone without a job since college? So you graduate college or grad school. And my logic is, so raise your hand if you haven't had a job for more than six months, meaning you've been out of work for six months. Oftentimes what happens? Crickets. And I was an actor for 15 years. The norm is to not have work. The norm is uh, a lot of my friends still don't have health insurance. And if you don't know that experience of, and there's massive Gallup data, et cetera, the second you don't have work, mostly what happens, and you don't have insurance, is you immediately start worrying about your health. And shockingly, it means your health goes down fast. Mm -hmm. And so to ignore things like the mental health realities, and not mental health of like, um, you know, conditions that might be more formally uh, named or what have you. Just like, of course, someone gets fired and the second you lose your job, especially for me as a, as a father, how, how am I taking care of my kids and, and my wife? Or my, We both work, so how can my wife take care of us? It, so I bring all that up because I have no more patience to talk about these things in isolation or in sort of esoteric broad uh, senses of like, well, <laughs> Yeah, future of work, and how about the future of now? Mm -hmm. And 2008 was a reality. And I'm not anti-American, but 2008, people premeditatively lied, broke the law, the mortgage crisis happened, the economy was put in ruins, and, and different sectors were sort of allowed to kind of keep doing what they're doing to restore and order, air quote. And what happened is we have these conversations now about AI and labor, and I'm like, again, I just think of a lot of my friends, um, and frankly, myself included. The middle class was decimated in the States, decimated. It's one $10,000 bill that can ruin a family. And I don't mean like ruin a family, like it's gonna be a tough year this year, Christmas gifts are gonna be, it's like, no, 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 $10,000 bill means you don't pay a mortgage, and then boom, 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 boom. And, and I'm like, if 2008 happened, 
and it happened. Why are we not talking about that in every one of these conversations? Not to come from a place of finger pointing or being accusatory, that's not my interest, or to, to demonize. But it's to say the technology also has to work on the economics. And things like reskilling, I have no, in Europe, happy to talk about reskilling. I've been in a lot of panels in Europe, reskilling, I'm like, cool, what does that mean? Well, this university is doing this, or there's this free application for whatever, awesome. And by the way, I'm never going to not say reskilling. I mentioned my grandfather. Anytime there's a learning opportunity, great. But again, when you, I was an actor for 15 years, like, you don't get a severance when a job ends. Um, and especially now, I just like to ask, especially in the States, I shoot my hand up. What do you mean by reskilling? Well, emotional intelligence is important. Couldn't agree with you more. I'm like, you know, the poster child for emotional intelligence. I'm really glad now it's in vogue. But who pays my bills? Who pays for my kids to go to college? Well, you know, this, that's, that's a universal basic income discussion. But, 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 nope. Nope, it's not. This whole event is about AI and the future of work. The present state of work is most people, I don't know, certainly around the world, but largely in the States, if they have work, they're clinging to it tenaciously. And then when these things might come in, and the technology is glorious and beautiful, but out of context, and truck drivers, it's a different discussion, but that sort of example, it's not just that they'll lose their jobs and we feel bad. It's that how quickly they'll lose jobs and how that will affect the entire economy, that it's a sustainability question, not because we're green or because we, you know, yay, we love trees. This is about, this is what happened in five or 10 years. It's not just retraining a certain sector. It's retraining us, policymakers, and the technologists. Structure, right? Because this idea of reskilling is all but a moot point if you don't have the infrastructure and institutional will to actualize that, right? to be agile and ready enough to move in the different directions of the necessary skills to rescale a population. Right, or I actually think reskilling, yes, um, the agility, but also to say reskilling in a GDP world, we're done. Mm -hmm. Like for my answer is we're failed, done, period, end of story. People are like, oh, yeah. like, but, but, but no. Because reskilling where there's a mandate for policymakers and businesses to be sort of enslaved to a single bottom line. Mm -hmm. That single bottom line is exponential growth. Technology is designed to be autonomous and intelligent and replicate skills by design. Those two end values, those two key performance indicators, they work in lovely unison, but they do not. They do not honor human finite environmental finite levels. And to me, saying things like augmenting will work together with, cool, awesome. But we're augmented, I get it, it's five years from now, and by the way, I'm not trying to be funny here, like I have augmented reality contact lenses put into my eyes like LASIK, which I'd be kind of cool as a geek, I love that idea. But who's paying my bills? Mm. And I love asking those questions because the reskilling is a societal reskilling. Because me learning more about emotional intelligence, if I can get hired, and I'm the same as tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people, then all of these things can also be a massive distraction to say, well, let's kind of let's kind of be down here. And, and sure, I'm not saying people shouldn't get reskilled, and a lot of people will get rehired. Great, but the actuality of the number of new jobs, um, from my understanding, all the different research from the forum and you know, great places, is like. It's, there will be new types of jobs, but there will be less and less people needed with much more highly specialized things in them. So reskilling someone like, hey, let's go reskill up someone who's been you know, a programmer or someone who's even managed a small team of people to understand in-depth philosophical ideas and emotional intelligence. Like, what? <laughs>
I think they should go because you're hearing like, take a left, take a <laughs> left, right? So that's an interesting side thing. But um, you know, more and more you read about like someone like you're driving and you'll see a big sign that says like work, road work ahead and your GPS, even if it's Waze, which is like minute to minute updates, didn't update for some reason, the satellite's down. So you're like, oh, I guess I take a left. Kink, 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 kink. And you take a left and you're like, and then like some guy's like, did you see the sign? <laughs> Hello, speed bump, like, hello, what, are you an idiot, you know? And, uh, and you're like, well, my GPS said to take a lap. And, and it's not because people are dumb, you know? Like, it's because you, you, you quickly trust something because it's a really cool thing and it's saving you time. Mm -hmm. But um, I talk about this all the time, is like devices in homes that can start to, if the right word is usurp, or if the word is sort of we give over willingly, Little things like, as a parent, taking care of kids, especially when kids are young, like you'll, I'm joking here, right? You'll almost kill someone to get a full night's sleep, right? You're obviously not going to. But the point is, is that you're so desperate. So like if a, if a machine or system can sort of like help a parent, you know, and like books on tape, uh, you know, devices that can read stories in different voices, that's really cool. But uh, there's a great TV show called Humans. Um, it's a British show. And the first season, there's this great uh, scene I love. I find it harrowing, but wonderfully an example here of the giving over to a system. There's an android, and of course, what's really nice is most of the androids are these glorious young models. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, they have like two old people androids, and I'm like, yes! And that one's fat! Thank goodness! Right. <laughs> They're old models, you know. But at least like one of them is sort of fat, and I'm like, sweet! Boo comes out of them. Yeah. Like morphology. Um, but there's a, the main beautiful android woman is taking care of this family where the, the human mom suffers from alcoholism. And the human mom comes home one night after a bender and says to like the six-year-old daughter, like, come on, let's go upstairs. I want to read you a story. And the girl goes, I want Susan to read to me and points to the robot. And the mom's like, well, I'm here tonight. And she's like, I know. I want Susan. And that, I saw that as a dad and that scared me more than any drones slaying me and cutting me in half or robots taking over my brain. I was like, there's a strong chance that that, that line that's different for every family, different for every individual, and I'm not interested in telling a person how they should parent, except to say that I think if you're not an invested parent, I would say, why are you having kids and all that, but is to say like that line of like the technology to help that demarcation between where something can sort of take over, if a person doesn't know what that is, then they won't know when they've lost it until it's too late. Or they will know when they've lost it. But then they'll go, what are you going to say? In that example, like they get rid of the android and the girl is bereft. And yeah, the question about social contract, and this also goes back to uh, the question about work. Mm -hmm. And I'll talk now about well-being because I really want, especially the last portion of my interview, to hopefully seem positive because <laughs> that's my goal. Um, <clears throat> it's a question of worth. And I think a lot of times uh, the reason I went to school to be a minister, uh, I have a lot of friends who are in faith-based traditions, you know, a lot of people we're working with um, are Buddhist, you know, or Eastern traditions is sort of one central question about a lot of these technologies, or one assumption, I should say, is ethics, values, augmentation. The real sort of like leaning forward and whispering thing that people are saying is, it's because humans are so broken, we can fix the humans. And uh, on one level I'm like, yeah, there's wars, there's violence, and, and uh, those things to fix them or address them, yes. But then there's this question of like, what is our brokenness? Like the scene with this woman who's an alcoholic, like, who doesn't have a friend who struggles with some kind of addiction? Is the logic like us versus them? Now oh, they're an addict, that's too bad. And from a faith-based tradition, uh, I went to college to be a um, minister, uh, meaning in the uh, Methodist tradition. But the more you actually study things like Greek and Aramaic, what's called the New Testament, meaning you, you read, you know, how things were passed around. It wasn't like, you know, oh, hey, 
<laughs> the English translation of the Bible just appears Jesus' words in red. Like, Thank you, King James. We're good. <laughs> right. And, oh, King James, please. You know, like, <laughs> if you even know how things were canonized in like 400. But when you actually follow things back, and I'm a historian, right? I majored in history in college, and you see how did something pass from one person to the other through these things called codexes? Or the idea was something they looked at and read, or they heard through an oral tradition standpoint, so transformed them with a powerful message that changed who they were, that in the case of early Christianity, people were Jewish. Like, this is, you know, shockingly, if any people think that Jesus was Jewish, <laughs> I don't, okay, enjoy the fruit. Like, I don't know what to tell you. Versus, like, understanding that, from my understanding, in that time in Palestine and wherever else, the first, especially the first generation, they saw somebody who historically is called Jesus. And then what they did is they told this message at risk to being eschewed from their current community, meaning Jewish community, um, and then certainly like Rome and different types of, the, and amongst you know, their own people like zealots who wanted to focus on war. And for me, um, you know, and then of course what happened with the Christian tradition, that's a whole other conversation, but I can certainly understand when people say, how can you be a Christian? Because I agree, there's so much horror that's been done, not just for Christianity, but in, in faith or religious, uh, you know, name. Where, but I'm like, but that's not why people, at least for me, my life was transformed. My life was transformed because <clears throat> at the core, there are times that I don't feel I have worth. There are times that I feel worthless. And if a message comes of healing, of transformation through faith, and of course it's not just through Judeo-Christian traditions, and it's not just Buddhism, it's not even formal religious traditions, agnosticism, atheism, but an examined life. But if the message kind of keeps coming back to you like, you're okay, but you're actually broken, and this can fix you. It's not about the technology or AI. It's about what are we saying to ourselves that we can't address some of these things on our own and these questions of worth? And, um, so I want to talk about well-being because outside of a faith tradition that I hold for myself, which is I believe I have worth, it's sort of the golden rule, which is pretty common amongst a lot of religious and non-religious traditions, my worth can come from increasing other people's well-being through treating them as I would like to be treated. So one thing about the golden rule is it's actually proactive, right? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Do unto others. There's an action to that. It's not leave people alone and don't kill them, right? Which is sort of implied. But well-being based on positive psychology, right, which is an empirical, psycho, you know, based on psychoanalysis for the last 20 years, is action-based. It's not mood. You can be a grumpy dude like I am at times, <laughs> pessimist, but when you are grat like gratitude, right? You do an example of gratitude and you sort of think of like, here's four things I'm grateful for. You can be angry, mad, not happy, old, young, any color. This is what I love about well-being is it's got a universality amongst humans anywhere around the world. And you think, well, I'm grateful for my son. I'm grateful for my wife. I'm grateful for this. And you start to pause, and there's this physiological, an actual physiological change that happens. You can measure an MRI machine and see the brain patterns change. You can see dopamine spike, right? Is there's a physical change to when you take action to improve well-being. And then when you start to get to understand economic indicators that measure objective and subjective well-being. And for me, one thing, if, if someone, if anyone watching this video, if you haven't read the 2009 Stiglitz Report, um, the Stiglitz Report, President Sarkozy of France at the time said to Joseph uh, Stiglitz, Amartya Sen, a lot of these world-leading economists, all right, we've been hearing now for a couple of decades since Bobby Kennedy gave the, air quote, beyond GDP speech, that GDP may not be the best only measure for society. Let's just, let's just get together and think about this. When you read the report, you might think like, is this like a squishy, like happiness thing? Like everyone should, you know, eat candy and talk about clowns. <laughs> Not at all. It's about how do we measure what we build? How do we measure a society, what prosperity really means? And the Stiglitz report says, I'm basically quoting verbatim, but look it up. 
anyone who's watching this, human well-being is easier to measure than productivity. That blew my mind. I thought the Stiglitz report was going to be like, we should all hold hands and kumbaya. It's, it's productivity is like something happens and a year later you measure it and productivity this. Whereas well-being is a, a state of flourishing or the Greek word is eudaimonia, which is mirrored in Eastern traditions as well. Is this sense of there's a balance of an individual, what well-being is. There's subjective data, that's how they talk about their experience, their life satisfaction. And there's subjective data, do they have access to clean water, education. But this, this lens of what is taken to measure goes from being this myopic productivity, productivity, exponential growth, which demands, this is what capitalism and consumerism mirrors. I'm worthy because I buy stuff. What if I can't afford it? Am I not, I don't have worth anymore? Versus, I say all this to say, the message I'm so excited so many people seem to be agreeing on is what we can actually change is the whole idea of single bottom line to go to triple bottom line at least to people, planet, and profit and say if these things in unison all have the same level of importance so that each quarter, like when people, this is my dream, the CEO closes the door and she goes in and talks to her shareholders. Hey, we made our fiscal numbers. Hey, all right, bonuses this year. And we made our environmental numbers. Right? It's not just a corporate social responsibility greenwashing. It's we had to make tough choices to not get more fiscal numbers because our environment. And then things like, what about suicide and, and depression that's at pandemic levels? Mm -hmm. It's not just their, um, their choice of, uh, of, of things to donate money to. It's the sense of, and I'm not trying to put this just on businesses. Mm -hmm. It's got to be policy in all citizens as well. But if there's this sense of, with these beautiful, glorious technologies, not just AI for good, like let's take care of each of the UN SDGs separately in isolation, but rethink, really innovate and rethink these ideas that were set like in the 1940s and 50s and 60s about how to measure human prosperity. Mm -hmm. They don't make sense in 2018 anymore. And the opportunity, by the way, I'm not saying that, I don't know, maybe we will turn into, in one sense, machines will become cyborgs, literally. Maybe the machines that we look at will have ascensions to them. Like, I'm okay with those things. I wrote my book to work through that kind of fear. What I'm not okay with in my work um, uh, is to just sort of be like, cool, let's see what happens. Or to say that we can innovate everywhere else but here. And those two places here are money. Oh, but, 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 you're, you're hindering innovation typically means you're messing with my money. Mm -hmm. And I was an actor for 15 years, I get it. Like if you haven't used it, if you haven't maxed out a credit card, like I get it. <laughs> but then the other thing is innovation, if a person has never asked themselves tough questions about themselves, and they may not have come from, like me, a faith tradition or whatever else, it's not that I would say that they're wrong or bad. It's what a glorious opportunity. Do you know who you are? Do you know the beauty of who you are, even in your brokenness? Do you know that your brokenness and your foibles are probably the reason that so many people maybe fell in love with you, right? A foible to one person is endearing to someone else. And I'm not trying to in any way say like, well, allow bad things to happen in ethics. And I'm saying, no, 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 it's not until we actually ask these tough questions of who we are mm -hmm. and, and then say, how do we imbue these into our systems? And especially things like the same example of GPS, kind of giving over the map skills to things like parenting. I'm happy, me, John, to put a flag in the ground and say, I think it is wrong to just say, I'm going to let machines take care of my kids. I do, me, John, no one else that I work with. Because it's not just that it's wrong, like, oh, you're a bad person, it's you are missing out. Why would you not trust that you can also be a good parent and steward and have one of the best experiences of a human life to be yeah. a parent? So it's a great question in terms of values and well-being and autonomy. And one thing I love about economic indicators, when you study something like the OECD Better Life Index, and you even look at the phrase like time management, for instance, uh, time management is very didactic and empirical. And what we're used to in the West is saying like, how many hours a week do you spend at work? 
50, 60, 70, 80, whatever it is. And then when you ask the second question, well, what about, for instance, your family? A lot of times it's where you are in your life that then dictates your values for that era. So typically in your 20s, you know, when you're not married, if one chooses to be married, that's when you're like, I can do 60, 70 hours. You know, my value at this time is to be with work. Cool. What that actually means is an examined life. You're saying right now the era where I'm in, I'm valuing uh, time at work to build a life, not just for money, but because I love my work. But then time management, say when you're a parent and you start realizing if you're you know, a parent who wants to hang out with your kids more, um, you might say, well, 70, 80 hour weeks, I mean, I don't see my kids. And you get, maybe it's guilt, an awareness of that. Well, so first of all, if you don't even ask those questions, then the guilt or whatever else will just happen. And some empirical things happen. You aren't with your kids as much. Does that mean that they're going to be bad kids or whatever? No. It just means that you don't know. And I'm always intrigued when it's engineers or people who are empirically minded, which I, I th like to think I am, although I know I'm very right-brained as well, is I ask the question, like, if you don't know your values, then you can't list them. And then, then you can't list, like, ten things. Then I'm like, how do you know you're living to them? And if it's a faith-based thing, it's like, well, I go to church, I go to temple, I do that. Cool. So does that dictate your life, or is it just kind of a uh, you know, place that you go every week because they, they serve good food? Like with Methodists, you know, food. It's all about the food. Like I think at one point John Wesley was like, you got to have little white marshmallows in jello. I don't know why. That seems to be a huge thing among Methodists, um, randomly. Um, anyway, but the reason to bring this up is that then when you start to, like uh, last year I was in Dubai for the World Government Summit, and the people who've been doing the UN World Happiness Reports for the last five years, Jeffrey Sachs, Lord Richard Layard, and John Halliwell, put out the first version of the happiness policy document. It's fascinating. And it's things like with smarter city technology, um, Internet of Things. Um, it's not rocket science to think about, like, say there's, you know, we're here in Pittsburgh at Carnegie Mellon, right? So there's a traffic jam. <coughs> there's a traffic jam over there. I wonder if people's well-being is diminishing because of a traffic jam. Hmm. Well, you can have them wear a Fitbit type thing that measures uh, sweat. <coughs> you know, but that's, I'm used to it. Mm -hmm. You can wear a Fitbit thing that measures sweat, which is a correlation for stress. And you can you know, measure all kinds of physiological data, eyes narrowing, you know, in-car tracking is already a big thing through affect and stuff. But it's not just that you can measure that people's well-being is being affected. You can immediately have interventions, both from a psychological and mental health standpoint, but a policy standpoint, and certainly a business standpoint, where if the data is taken care of, so that's a different subject we haven't touched on, but if people are at the center of their data through sovereign data structures, peer-to-peer -peer exchange, finite amounts of data, their choice, all that, and you're sitting in your car and you drive towards, like Waze can already tell you, like there's a traffic jam ahead, and you're like, I know, I'm looking at it. But you start to drive up to it and boom, you get a thing that says, hey, you're near Starbucks. Sorry about the stress. Free coffee for the next hour if you want to pull over. And the policymakers who are sitting, I mean the, the, the smarter city people, maybe they're actually rerouting. And it's like a flight, you know, like, hey, do you want 500 bucks to skip this flight and go to Denny's for a couple, <laughs> I don't know, like Denny's. Um, and you go, yeah. I have a choice. Cool. I'm going to take the 500 bucks and take a flight later today. Dee -dee -dee -dee. Right. So that people don't think about that as economic indicators. They're just like smarter city. And I'm like, well, it's an economic indicator. You can know mood and well-being, and you can you can say. And by the way, you can also do maps in these parts of the city through through wearing these things. These particular spots, for some reason, at these times of day these wristbands register stress for some reason, and it's not traffic. So now you have a clue. What is it about the, you know, that physical part of a city that there's something that we can address? And the policy book, if you read it, it's just mind-blowing. Things like safety. Safety is often in the OECD indexes. Um, safety being measured as an economic indicator means that policymakers can improve and help safety and the feeling of safety. And uh, I think it was in Boston, there was something that happened where crime rates, crime rates were raising in a certain time frame, and in the policy report it explains it better. But they just put out more 
cop cars so people could see them visually. And I forget how they did it in such a way that there was the question of, you know, do you feel scared? And people are like, yeah, I feel more scared the last couple months. And then the answer for the policymakers came out, we're going to put out more cops in the streets. And by the way, they did, right? It wasn't just, but then when they put them out, then they kind of said, like, how do you feel? All the things can happen in seconds through giving permission to some kind of device. This is where the machine learning or AI is incredibly helpful. But then when the, the cop cars, people saw them physically, right, through a sweat measurement. Oh, thank God. So this is when you talk about happiness and well-being indicators. It moves from being this sort of squishy, like, how do you measure this? Because the objective data is, and we can argue about, are they taking the data well? Mm -hmm. but, but they took some data. Maybe there's eventually brain mapping and all this other stuff. But then the social science asking through surveys, how do you feel about that? I feel great. I was freaked out a couple weeks ago. You guys gave me more cops on the streets. Thank you. Thanks to the cops. And it has to be done in ways where trust is imbued so it's not just greenwashing or whatever. But my whole point there is that well-being is oftentimes much more objective and solid than other things. Quick example too, Chip Conley has a great TED Talk. Fantastic. It's got like millions of views. He points out that the GDP, 60% of the GDP measures service-oriented industries. And we all go, oh, yeah, service, okay, GDP. And he's like, but what is a service-oriented? He says, what happens when you go to a hotel? What do you do at the end of every hotel stay? You fill out a survey. How was our service? I'm pretty good. So it's aggregated uh, subjective data that becomes in one sense objective data because 10,000 people said these hotels are great. So in our mind, the GDP is this sort of like, this is it. But again, I keep talking about this because it's, I, I keep thinking how much it's the one criteria that drives the, the planet because everyone says, and I hate these terms, developed versus undeveloped, or third world countries. But when you actually understand a larger sense of flourishing, mm -hmm. there's a lot of countries that, and by the way, I would never say don't give them water or food and human rights, and done. That's the floor. Maslow, human rights, that's always the priority. But in places where a nuclear family is still solid, or places like in Brazil where, you know, unfortunately the government is dealing with a lot of struggles with some pretty major negative stuff, but the family structure is strong with aunts and uncles living around. There's the objective things. I don't have anyone to take care of my kids. I can't afford a babysitter. Well, I have my aunt, right? In the West, a lot of times, isolated nuclear families, all they can do is pay someone to take care of their child, and then they don't see their kids. And if that's their choice, that's their choice. But then well-being oftentimes diminishes. Mm -hmm. And so the whole point here is that when you actually sort of say like, oh, economic indicators... OECD, et cetera, are simply more ways of looking at ourselves individually and as society. So we can actually say if prosperity is not just this one thing, it becomes more complex, but it also becomes so much easier. And um, so I guess my final message here with, with well-being is uh, there's all these different indicators and movements where the sort of AI for good which is fantastic, and the UN Sustainable Development Goals are oftentimes now considered an indicator. But it's in their holistic working together, A, and B, a recognition that we can't just say, well, the benefits of AI have to work for everyone. Well, everyone and everything, right, meaning if we call the planet a thing, um, it actually then, to try to make these things work in this utterly constrained system of exponential growth, how do we fix it over here? Then that's not really innovation. And I, I marvel that we have conversations about AGI and mm -hmm. certainly artificial superintelligence. And it, I can be in certain rooms and say, hey, someday my, my phone might be Steve. Right? Mm -hmm. I'm not joking. Like it yeah. might have a level of sentience beyond anthropomorphism. Right. But where I talk about, but innovation can actually be making these three things equal and also saying, what about a person having worth without needing any form of augmentation or whatever else. Meaning what happens, you know, we all know this. You lose power on your iPhone or, you know, the, the power goes out, and certainly with hurricanes and stuff happening. Like, are we going to be able to maintain well-being without the technology as well as with? Yeah. And, and that's where I'm, I'm so excited about. I think I keep seeing these little breaks where I'm never, I'm, uh, and this is why I love working with IEEE and with the council, the technology is always glorious. To me, I'm a geek. 
but it's the technology with the recognition of how it will affect well-being that then we can actually have positive, beautiful transformation for, for humans and what we become.